It was great to see your children up front. They are truly a blessing to this church. And parents and grandparents, we want to thank you for choosing to be used by God in training these kids up. And one of the ways that we train our children is using Bible books for kids. For instance, might read, we might read uh, Genesis and uh, creation story, Noah's Ark, Moses, Jonah and the Big Fish, a.k.a. Whale, Daniel in the lion's den, and Jesus. These are some of the tools that uh, you as parents might have used, might have received as a baby shower gift, or you went out and purchased because you see the need, the benefit to lay a foundation for the kids to know what Scripture has to say. But sometimes with these stories, we might relate it to only a kid's story. But it's not just a kid's story. These stories are found in Scripture for our benefit. For instance, in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the Scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So ladies and gentlemen, we have encouragement and hope between these pages. I encourage you on a daily basis to find what that is. One of the stories I want to touch on that is a kid's story, but yet it is a story found in the Bible, and that is David and Goliath. So before I start, I would ask the uh, congregation, we have one more prayer. So, Father, we do want to thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for all of us here in this church this morning and listening online. For there's a message that you want to teach and to show us uh, through the story of David and Goliath. So we ask for your Holy Spirit to be in the sanctuary, be in our hearts. I pray that you would be in my heart to empty me of self that I would be humble and used in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So our story is found in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17. I invite you to go there. And while you're there, the title of the sermon is called The Underdog. And The Underdog in the Webster's Dictionary says, a competitor thought to have little chance of winning a fight or a contest. You could relate that definition definitely to David, and we're going to find out why. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle, and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes the Meme. So right away, picture in your mind. So when we're reading the story, picture the scene, all right? So the armies of the Philistines are lining up for battle. The Philistines were known to be the enemies of God. Throughout the Philistines' uh, uh, period, whenever they had an opportunity, they wanted to fight God's people, Israel. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. So now you have the Philistines, and now you have the Israelites ready for battle. This isn't what wasn't new for them, but they were ready for battle. The Philistines stood on one mountain, on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. 
So I looked up on a map where actually was this battle at. So it happened in Israel, and Telesafai is currently a national park. So they did some excavation uh, prior to this becoming a part, and they discovered remnants of the battle, and they related to the battle of David and Goliath. And we're going to look at a bird's eye view of this area. The brown area is where the battle took place. So on one side, you had Israel on the left side, and on the right side, you had the Philistines. And here's a closer-up view of the scene. And it's pretty amazing to, to know that this is the exact place that this story took place. We're going to continue on in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Six cubits and a span relates to nine feet, six inches. That's the tallest person that's been recorded to be. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, which is a jacket covered with a composed of metal rings or plates serving as armor. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, or the weight of it was 125 pounds. That's a whole person. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, or 33 pounds. And the shield-bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out with the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself, and let him come down to me. Now Saul, at the time, was the king of Israel. Who should have went and fought Goliath? Saul. Saul was the leader of the pack. Saul was the example, or should have been the example of the pack. But we're going to find out he didn't do it. Now this is Goliath continuing. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Now let me ask you, this is between uh, God's people and Satan's people, right? Do you think if God's people lost a battle, they would give up and serve the Philistines? Actually, as Christians, we would, right? Because Christians are honest to our word, right? If they're losing this battle, there's a difference between God's people being honest and true, right? And Satan's people as liars. Because if you, if the Philistines lost the battle, you would think they would humble themselves and become their servants, Israel? No, they wouldn't. And we're going to find out what happened, that they didn't. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' word, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. So Goliath was not only mocking the Israel army, they were, he was intentionally mocking God. And you would think if somebody's mocking God, you would stand up for God, right? But the Israel didn't. Saul and his people, they were dismayed and terrified. They saw Goliath 
as this big problem, as this giant. They were looking at the problem. Instead, they should have been looking at God to fight their battle. We, as we're living life, and even today, we have those giants in our lives. And we might be tempted to look at that problem. How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to find another job? How am I going to raise my children? But I encourage you, if you're looking at the problem, you, like Saul, will be dismayed and terrified. But if we transfer our look and our hope into God, who gives us courage and encouragement and hope, we are able to face those giants in our lives a lot better and stronger. We want a king. Now we're going to go back in time in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Before there was even a king Saul, Israel had never had a king before. Their king was God. And God spoke through prophets, priests, and judges. And Samuel was a prophet and a judge, and God spoke to them. But they weren't satisfied. They wanted a king. They wanted to see somebody uh, physical. They wanted to see somebody to physically fight our battles for. And they weren't satisfied. And look at uh, Samuel's response. But when they say, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Little encouragement for those that go witness. You'll have great moments. People are accepting what you want to give them. But there are many cases where people shut their door, get upset at you. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting God. And always remember that. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. We only hear certain parts of the story of what Saul was like. But God, continuing that uh, chapter 8, talks about the character of Saul. Saul is going to take people from Israel and use them for his benefits. Making a better chariot, taking their lands and vineyards for himself as well as for his workers. He's going to use the women to be perfumists. I had to look this up, what a perfumist is. It's somebody that mixes... Um, different scents, and they're professional at it to come up with a more beautiful scent. So he's going to use the women for that. He's also going to use the women to cook and bake for him. So this king is not going to serve the people. He's going to serve himself and how he could benefit through them. But Samuel warns them, or God through Samuel, warns them. Because they're going to wake up and see that this person that we wanted for so long isn't what we cracked up to be. When the day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. Everything that Samuel was telling them, what was going to be, this king was going to be like, they were like, no, no. We don't want to listen. 
We just want a king. Then we will be like the other nations with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. What did they want? Not only a king, but they wanted a king just like everybody else. They wanted to be like everybody else. I remember a time in this church, personally I remember, that this church wasn't as active as it is today. This church was not as filled as it is today. And we were praying for new people to come and we were praying for programs to start the community and, and grow this church. And at the time, the mega churches started to pop up. All right? And that was a big thing. These mega churches, they have thousands of people. And they were using music, lights, entertainment. Not judging anybody, but this is what we, we saw, right? And some were looking at these churches and say, hey, maybe we can implement some of this stuff into our church. But we didn't because we wanted to follow God's plan. We wanted to follow God's standards. And praise God, he has blessed this church tenfold. The chosen one. This is where Saul comes into the picture. Kish had a son named Saul, a handsome as a young man could be found anywhere in Israel. And he was head and tall, a head taller than anyone else. So they were looking at the looks, the height, and thinking this is the guy. And God knew this because God chose Saul. But God knew what the people in their sinful hearts wanted, so he was going to give it to them. You ever wonder why God might not answer a prayer that we have? Because it's not in our best interest. And we have to trust that time when he says no, right? But if we're constantly on him and wanting this, wanting this, sometimes God, okay, I'll let you have it. And then down the line, you see that it wasn't really the best choice to make. So God loves us, and he wants the best for our lives, and we have to trust in him. Israel had to trust in God and his program, but they didn't. They lost focus. Saul answered. This is where um, Samuel went to Saul. You are the guy that's going to be king. Now listen in the beginning what, what he talks about. Before I was saying... Uh, scripture was saying all the terrible things he was going to be, but Saul wasn't like that in the beginning. But I am not a Benjamite from the. I, but I, yeah. But am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such things to me? Why are you calling me to be a king? The Spirit of the Lord, your God, will come upon you, powerfully upon you. And you will prophesy with them. And you will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Even though that God knew what Saul was going to turn into, God was encouraging Saul, I will be with you. Okay, Saul was humbled. Who am I for you to choose me? I am in the smallest tribe. I'm nobody. You might feel that you're small, insignificant, nobody. But God sees in every person here, through his help, what you could become. Amen. So do not 
allow fear, insecurities to stop you to move forward in your walk with the Lord. I can only imagine, I can't speak for them, but for these groups here that's just starting off doing Bible studies, really? You want me to do a Bible study? You want me to lead a Sabbath school class? They didn't see the potential in them. But through God's blessing and encouragement and wisdom, they're becoming mighty teachers. Samuel continues, Go down ahead of me into uh, Gilgal. I will surely come down uh, to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and all these signs were fulfilled that day. So what happened between Samuel chapter 10 and Samuel's chapter 17? Something changed, and we're going to find out what changed in Saul's life. To obey, to obey is better than sacrifice. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, let me go back. God had told Saul to go out to the Amalekites. The Amalekites were just like the Philistines. They hated God and they hated God's people. Okay? So they were also an enemy of God. But God said, okay, this day I want you to go and destroy the Amalekites. All of them. Do not leave anyone or anything alive. So Saul went out to battle. He killed everybody except a few things. He kept the king alive and he kept the animals alive. And they brought him back into the camp. And he's thinking, wow, Samuel's going to be happy. I brought back the king. I brought the best animals that the Amalekites had. This is going to be good. I did good. But Samuel was not pleased. And Samuel said, you didn't obey the Lord. In 1 Samuel 15, 20, 21, it says, But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went out to the mission for the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took the sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God at Gilgal. A couple of things. He just testified what he did. And it's funny, he says, I obeyed the Lord. Did he obey the Lord? He obeyed 99.9% of it, but that 0.1% he didn't obey, and he disobeyed God. In addition, it just hit me yesterday, on the last part of 21, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord, your God, Samuel, so now Saul is not saying he's my God. Something's happening into his mind. But he's calling, saying, Samuel, this is your God. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of deviation and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he, meaning God, has rejected you as king. Leaders in this church, God calls us to a higher standard. God wants us to be 100% connected with him to lead his flock. And when we're not connected with the Lord, when we're not doing the things the Lord has told us to do, it's not going to be good. Then Saul said to Samuel, now his eyes are open. I have sinned. 
I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. So now he's blaming his people for his decisions. Sometimes we do that. We don't want to take the responsibility, so we're pointing at others. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king of, over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. So I'm envisioning in my mind now Saul is kneeling, begging Samuel to forgive him, that God would forgive him, and make everything new again. But Samuel said, no, that's it. I'm done. He walks away and he holds and tears his uh, hem of the garment, of the robe. And here's something prophetic, very powerful. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one who is better than you. Why was he better than Saul? Because we're going to find out who that person is, but David had that relationship with the Lord. That's why he was better than Saul. Saul gave up on God, and he was doing his own thing. Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel. Come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. So, for him to say, come back with me before the elders of my people and before Israel, he wanted to save face. He didn't want to be embarrassed for Israel to know they no longer have a king, right? So he's thinking again of himself. Now we're going to get in David, the anointed. David's father, Eli, Jesse. Jesse had eight sons, okay? Eight sons. And he was uh, working with and training God told Samuel to go to Jesse. God told Samuel that you're going to find the next king of Israel there. So when the eldest son comes and saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointing stands here before me. He must have been tall, dark, and handsome. Something about Eliab caught Samuel's eye. Even Samuel is looking on the appearance. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks, but the Lord looks at the heart. God wants a humble heart in any, all of us. It's not how we look. It's how we are. Are we humble for the Lord to work with us? So he sent for him and had him... Wait. So now... Jess, or, uh, Samuel asked uh, Jesse, do you have any other boys? Because he had eight, and I only see seven. Samuel didn't know that, and he says, do you have any boys, other boys? He says, yeah, there's my youngest son. He's in the field tending sheep, all right? So Samuel says, uh, bring him here to me. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health, 
and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. He had good-looking features. And when it says he was glowing with health, it indicates he was a young person. Teenager. And God told Samuel, this is the one. Rise and anoint him. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. David was talented in music. He played what's called a lyre. All right? Now, since God has rejected Saul, God's Spirit has left Saul. And when God's spirit leads Saul, leaves Saul, what spirit comes into Saul? An evil spirit. So Saul was having trouble in his life. He was having troubled spirits. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now it says the evil spirit from the Lord. Should we take that literal? Should we take it that God has an evil spirit and God's giving that evil spirit to, to uh, Saul? No. God allows certain things to pass through him for his will, whether it's for teaching or if the person rejects him, there's no other case but the, the evil spirit. So when it said God... Um, a spirit of the Lord tempted him. God allowed that evil spirit to go to Saul. Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let the Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you and, will, and you will feel better. So Saul said to the attendants, Find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He is brave, a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. Then, sent, then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and skin of wine and a young goat and sent them with his son to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse saying, Allow David to remain in my servants for I am pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit of God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and then the evil spirit would leave him. Question. It, if good sacred music calms the soul, what we heard today was beautiful. Beautiful. That one song, the second one before the end, I'm Dreaming of a City, I think it was called. I'm thinking to myself, that would be if they would put it, you know, in my mind, the great controversy. That would be a great song for their theme song, right? That I'm dreaming about the city of God. So if good music calms the soul, what does bad music do? And you got to think about that. What we're allowing things to come in our minds, in our hearts, in our ears, right? Now we're going back to the battle, 1 Samuel 17. So we have Saul rejected as king. David is king. It wasn't official yet, right? It wasn't official that David, in God's eye, he is now king.
Then the Philistine says, This day I defy the armies of God, Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing this, the words, Saul and all his Israelites were dismayed and terrified. We're just repeating what we saw. What they saw was a giant, nine feet, six inches. So I looked online, and they say the tallest man recorded was this gentleman, Robert Waldro. You know how tall Robert was? Eight feet, 11 inches. Eight feet, 11 inches. And just a, a, a concept of the height difference. He died at a young age, not because his height. A lot of times when people are super tall, their heart grows too large for their body and they die. He died, I think it was age 22, he had to wear braces to help him stand up, to help him keep him steady. One of the braces uh, were digging into his ankle, and it got infected. So they did a blood transfusion on, uh, on him, Robert, but it didn't work. He died in his sleep uh, that next day. But we didn't have any actual pictures back then to take a picture of Samuel or uh, Goliath. But we have something closer, a poster. So this poster is the actual uh, size, nine feet, uh, six inches tall. And that's a standard, uh, that, that lady there is a standard height. So could you imagine what um, Israel saw when they saw Goliath, a ginormous person? Now, David was the son of uh, Ephratite, named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judea. Jesse had eight sons, and we're just recapping again. The Bible is recapping. And in Saul's time, he was very uh, old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. To, uh, the firstborn was Eliab, the second, Abadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul. So David stayed back. The three oldest went forward to fight. But David went back and forth. They would still, David was still helping out the battle, going back and forth from Saul to tent his father's sheep to Bethlehem. So he was still working. For 40 days, the Philistines came forward every morning and every evening and uh, took his stand. Israel had morning worship, even in the army. They stopped what they were doing, and they were worshiping the Lord. In the evening, they would do the same thing. And ironically, every morning and every evening, Goliath would come out and start talking smack to Israel, trying to distract them. I remember when we would... When we do, but and it still happens, but not as much, uh, whether it's our daughter when she was young or our dog, we would try to have family worship. The daughter is antsy, not paying attention. Yeah, she was an infant, but come on. <laughs> but a dog, uh, the dog would constantly, all day she's not complaining, but that moment in time, uh, she would want to go outside. She would want attention. The phone would ring. Anything to distract us, to not have him worship. And sometimes it got frustrating that it ruined the moment of our worship, right? So Satan uses distractions in your life to stop you from having worship with the Lord. One of the biggest distractions is in the morning, right? You wake up and you're tired. You feel that Either I don't have time for worship, I got to go to work, or I'm just too tired to do anything, right? God could help you overcome that moment to make sure that you have worship with, for him. Now, Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to the camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit See how your brothers are, 
are and bring back some assurance from them. So back then, obviously, they didn't have uh, FaceTime, Instagram. The way that Jesse was able to get word to war, they sent David to the battle to see how things are going. There with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. <laughs> Again, Jesse didn't know that they weren't fighting, right? They were scared. They were just standing there. What do we do? What do we do? Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of the shepherd, loaded up and set out, and Jesse had directed. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up uh, their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they are doing. David's excited to find out what's going on, how's the battle. So he asked his brothers. As he was talking to them, Goliath the Philistines, the champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, this is in Second Chronicles, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those who whose heart is loyal to him. So David hears Goliath talking, uh, um, ridiculing God in the army, and he hears this. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel, the king who will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will ex accept his family, exempt his family from taxes in Israel. So nobody's willing to fight, but Saul said, listen, any of you that want to step forward and fight, I'm going to bless you with wealth. I'm going to bless you with my daughter, and I'm going to bless you so you don't have to pay taxes ever. David asked the man standing with him, what? Or what will be done for the man who kills the Philistines and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David had connections with God. Why? Because David was a warrior. He was confident in God, and he says, Who is defying my God? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, This is what will be done for the man who kills him. David was connected with God, but he also was like mind boggled. What? This is an easy thing to do. And you're going to be willing to give, me, or give the person what? All the wealth, honor? When Elab, David's older brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know you're conceited. I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. So now this older brother, you're a pipsqueak. What are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. Look at David's response, just like a younger brother would say. Now what have I done? Right? Haven't you heard that in a family? Like I've heard, I've said it. Like now what? What have I done? Cannot even speak? He then turned away to someone else. So he's done with his brother. He's not going to argue with his brother. He turns now to somebody that was near him and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. When David said, um, what David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. So they heard that David is willing to fight this giant. So now word's getting back to Saul. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistines. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, 
You are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. Now, David is giving Saul his resume. What has happened in his life and how God had got him through it. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its, its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. So now, David's saying, Listen, I was able to take care of a lion. I was able to take care of a bear. I took the sheep out of its mouth. This is what I'm able to do through God's help. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistines will be like one of them because he has defiled the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, All right, go and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own uh, tuning. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. Do you think it fit, David? No. We might have seen pictures of it. Saul's uh, a tall man, grown man. David's a, a, a youth, and none of this fit. And also, David wasn't u- used to wearing armor, right? His battle was just himself and God. David fastened up his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. I'm done. I don't want this. It's uncomfortable. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistines. Why do you think there was only one Goliath, right, that was recorded? Why do you think David had five? I meant to write this down. I don't want you to trust me, but study on your own. Uh, Goliath had four other brothers. And if these four other brothers were as tall as Goliath, uh, they're not going to be happy. So David, just in case he had to take care of Goliath's brother, he was ready. Okay? Meanwhile, the Philistines, with his uh, shield-bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. Remember that brown spot in that uh, map? So now they're getting closer together. He looked David over and saw that he was a little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, in his, uh, uh, and he despised him, so he hated it. like he was offended. What? You're sending me a, a baby? To take care of me? And he said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Now he's threatening David. David said to the Philistines, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistines' army. Not only he's talking about um, Goliath, he's talking about the whole army. To the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. That was David's heart. It wasn't about him and his abilities to take care of this giant, to get all the the wealth that Saul was willing to offer. It was all about keeping the honor of God alive. 
All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistines move closer to attack him, so now Goliath's walking closer to David. Look what David does. David ran quickly toward the battle lines to meet him. David was anxious to take care of Goliath. When we see the giants in our lives, we should not be trembling. We should face our giants with confidence knowing that God will help me through this. In these last days, we are going to experience Trials that we've never experienced before. We're going, the world is going to experience troubles as such as was ever man was created. How are we going to survive that? We're going to survive it by having a personal connection with God, having, reading the Bible, not just reading it, studying it, memorizing it. Who knows that we're going to have access to Bibles? What's going to encourage us and strengthen us when we're running for our lives, right? When we're in caves, we're hiding, right, from the enemy. It's the Scriptures. In fact, in Great Controversy, Sister White talks about none but those who have fortified their minds and truths in the Bible will be able to stand in the last days. And it's a solemn uh, statement to make. But she's, she's right. We need to have the connection. And that's why we read kids' Bible story books to our children. So they could start building a foundation of their relationship with God and knowing Scripture. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistines on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down to the ground. That was a quick battle, right? A couple of things. It didn't just hit him and knock him out. What did the scripture say? It sank into his forehead. So sinking something into his forehead, this rock, he had to whip it pretty quickly, right? I'm going to show you a video because I did some research on um, biblical slingshots. And it's pretty fascinating what you're about to see. You know, we sing the song, Only a Boy Named David, and we think he's just round and round and round. They use slingshots for battle. They use slingshots to, it says, cut off portions of people's head when they're in battle. It goes that fast. In fact, it goes over 200 pounds, uh, miles per hour. And we're going to see a demonstration of this guy, not only the speed, but the accuracy of somebody that um, uses a slingshot.
The sun was off, as you can tell, but you got the picture. How fast he was able to uh, throw those items through the sling and how accurate. That was a, a taste of what Goliath had experienced with just a sling and a rock. So David triumphed over the Philistines with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran. Here he goes running again towards the giant. Ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. And he killed him and he cut off the head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Imagine that. David said, not only am I going to kill you, I'm going to cut off your head, and I'm going to take care of you Philistines. Now, remember when Goliath said, you know, if we lose, we'll be your servants. But if you lose, you're going to be our servants. Did they hold up in the bargain? No. They, they ran. And the soldiers were just dying as uh, Israelites were, were chasing after them. Here we are. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout of per, uh, and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along their Sheremai road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. There might be a bunch of people, Christians, in your group. And it only takes one person, not only Christians, but anybody. It only takes one person that has a connection to God to make a difference. When they saw David take care of the Philistine, they now have motivation. Now they know that we could take care of the Philistines. When we talk faith, when we walk faith, when we live faith, it encourages those around us. We can talk and be a pessimist about everything wrong with the world. But if you have an optimistic mindset and tone and words and encouragement, that lifts people up, all right? So keep in mind of that. And if you struggle with being a pessimist, God could change your heart. God could help you not look at the thorns that are on the rose, but he can help you look at the rose and appreciate it. David took the Philistine's head and brought it to the Jerusalem. He put the Philistine's weapons in his tent. As Saul watched David going out to meet the Philistine, he said to Abner, commander of the army, Abner, whose son is that young man? Abner replied, as surely as you live, your majesty, I don't know. The king said, find out whose son this young man is. He didn't know it was Jesse's son. So they asked David. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul. And David said, uh, still holding the Philistine's head, Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked him. David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. He was proud to be called Jesse's son. Fathers, you have a huge influence on your children. You want your children to be proud of you. And as they look at you, as they're growing up, help them see a man of God before them. Help them see that I am proud that my dad is a server and, and living for the Lord. Because I want to be just like that. And it's not just for dads. Obviously, it's for mothers, grandparents, any caretaker of the children. God is able. God is able. 
So I encourage you today with this message that we would not look at the giants in our lives, that we would look at God, that we would defend God's name in the world who mocks God. How do we defend God's name? Not laughing at the jokes that the world gives. How do we defend God's name? Not watching the things of the world and of sin and enjoying it, but turning away. That's how we honor God. Praise the Lord. Thank you for uh, your patience, and uh, we praise God for this message.